Okay, so part two. Part Tokyo. two, everyone. <laughs> so we're just continuing with the theme of dream out of body experience and whatnot that leads into different realms of topic. That may be quite interesting to people who are interested in these topics and whatnot. So, do you have anything you want to? Well, we just talk about the nature. Like uh, we were saying, like if you can do this in nature, it would be great. Just maybe we can like uh, feel the energy, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean nature has always played an important part in animistic belief and shamanic belief of our ancient ancestors and cultures. So it does make sense to like you know commune and to interact with nature more in order to learn things, do you get it? Mm. So there's that kind of a famous axiom, right? As above, so below. So basically everything that you see around you is a reflection of the so-called higher world mm. in a platonic kind of like concept of philosophy mm. in the Greek um, idea so it's been noted that people understood this that you know our world is just not like a random chaotic I think so. assemblage oh, of like things in which you know everything has no meaning and like it just formed out of evolution right. and out of like random chance and everything. And um, this narrative of like you know oh, everything just happened you know because of the chance and everything. I mean, I'm not saying some things could happen in chance. Mm. Yeah, that there is a probability in chance and things happening in that way. But I also believe things can happen according to certain structure and precedence to things. Do you get it? Like, you know, how they say in Greek mythology, you have the idea of like fates, basically. You're, when you're born, your fate is predetermined, mm -hmm. basically. So, you know, I'm not expert on Greek and Roman mythology and like, you know, <clears throat> um, concept and mythology behind it, but I'm just saying that they have this idea or notion that basically when you're born your life is already set mm -hmm. and you cannot change it how much however you think you have a free will and everything it's actually set and then programmed by the deities and gods mm -hmm. basically yeah so we don't we can say it's like our free will is like next to nothing in that kind of concept. But in like in different cultures, you know, like, you know, that kind of like a free will and concept of like um, predetermination or predestination can be altered by our own kind of volition and will as mm. well at the same time. Yeah. So whatever we do now has an effect on the future. Mm. This is a very this is a very common concept that we have mm. here. Like you know the law of cause and effect as we know, as we all know on a superficial level, on a surface level can be applied here and um, the law of cause and effect is you know beautifully explained in Hindu philosophy mm. the law of karma now when we hear the word karma everyone think oh no you know I did bad thing mm. and I'm gonna get that 
bad, 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 things bad, bad karma. Yeah, you say bad action, mm. you know, bad consequences return to me because I've done that, and like you know, there's no turning back to that. But you know, actually, many people misinterpret the word karma. Mm. Karma in Sanskrit, if you actually etymology or if you actually translate that language um, accurately, it means action. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So it means you can have good karma mm. and bad karma. Mm. So good action and bad action. Exactly. Well, we have in the Western world that basically if you if people talk about karma, oh, it's about doing a bad, bad action thing, and yeah. everything, and they, that's probably true, but that's mm. half of the truth. Because mm. Karma simply means action. So mm. whatever you do, good or bad, will come oh. back to you in equal measure. Mm. It might not be the, let's say you, <laughs> well, let's take an example. You. Um, deceive someone right mm. you've lied to someone it doesn't exactly mean like oh someone else you knew is gonna deceive you exactly in the same pattern no it's a very kind of like um it could spur that spread out mm. in an equal measure so why i mean is like like uh, one person could subtly lie to you mm. and you know trick you and whatnot and the other person could deceive you in doing certain things and like so and whatnot and you know some misfortune happened to you this all adds up to things you've done before mm. so that could coalesce to one thing mm. into the things you've done before yeah. So it's not like straightforward, like, okay, I run over someone, so I'm going to get run over. It's, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> in, in the scheme of things, because everyone has a different, like, uh, karmic debt, basically, or life action sequences mm. that could reflect in our own life. Because we live in a very different time, so cyclic, cyclical ages as well. You know? mm. So, you know, certain actions, certain karma can be held, you know, within life. It could spread out in different times, you get it? It could spread out into your future lives as well you get it mm. so if you believe in that kind of concept of a you know uh, reincarnation and everything so whatever we were given in this life was due to our past karma mm. basically so they have this kind of like you know law of cause and effect that has been talked about in Dharmic religion, Hinduism, Buddhism, they all talk about this. So the body we have, the gender we have, the ability we have, the mm. skills and talents we have, is actually um, attributed to the things we've done in the past. Mm. You know? Have you ever, like, uh, not research, but like, have you ever, like, uh, got interested in what your past, like, you know, what is your past, like, yeah, have you ever, like, uh, asked somebody? Um, I have, and, but I tend to take these kind of past life things to my intuitive kind of, like, um, feeling, you get it? Mm -hmm. And why I've been told by someone else uh, that can well, see, it? see my past life and everything uh, was like, um, this may sound really strange and everything, mm. but I was like a wolf in Mongolia. <laughs> wolf, not a human, a wolf. Yes, a wolf in Mongolia. Mm. But I also had 
of a past life in Mongolia as a person. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. As a human. As a human. Mm -hmm. So for me, like um. For me, scary, if I think of it, you are like a wolf type. Because you're always like a, you kind of like always like kind of black sheep in your brothers, yeah. and just like kind of always not alone. I don't want to say the word yeah. alone, but no, no. It, I agree with it, mm. and it's true. Like you know, there's that saying, you know, like you know, don't move, right? mm. don't move. Mm. There's that kind of like saying as well, and yeah. I feel like I may fake that mold, and I'm not saying it's like there's always like um. I felt like there's a spiritual connection. Mm. I always felt like a spiritual connection with wolf mm. as an animal, kind of like a spirit as well. You know? And you know, people say, oh, you know, animal spirit as a wolf is a very like you know overrated and common thing as well. Mm. But it doesn't feel like that to me. Mm. It feels very, you know, people say, oh, you know, I have a, you know, spiritual connection wolf and everything. Like you know, I'm not super superficial that kind of thing and you know i personally don't know if i'm really connected to the whole past life uh -huh. of wolf and everything but i feel a strong affinity with wolf if you say you man. feel then i think that's true yeah. yeah but you know i cannot know for sure unless mm. i can objectively <laughs> Verify that but, through that experience. You know what? If I see your brother Anthony, he has a brother, like older brother Anthony. He's like when I see him, like he's every move is like kind of like a dog. Like it. If I if it's somebody said he's like a past life is dog, I won't like a surprise. He look sometimes like uh, sorry, it's a bit different yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Your maybe your traditional family is like from like a dog family kind of thing. <laughs> Who says? Yeah. So um, so what I'm saying is basically like um, this whole notion mm -hmm. about like certain connection with animal spirit and mm -hmm. whatnot can actually be like um, quite profound as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, I think you see that theme of like the animal kind of like connection, mm. I'm like, you know, because, you know, guys, simply speaking, right, from my experience, mm. spiritual thing is just very intuitive, mm. you know, like, it's not really rational. It's like something you connect in more like um, on the on the level of your heart, basically, or the intu yeah. intuition you have to get it. It's like kind of like intuitive kind of understanding. It's not really rational. You get it. like you know, you may not. It may not make sense on a rational or like a brain level and then whatnot. But if you search further on that, you know, we are binary kind of being basically, mm -hmm. you know, everything is separated in like a binary kind of like um, concept, right? Basically, you know, no matter what people say, everything is in this world at least is binary. Mm -hmm. You get it? So if you're talking about things in general, there's light and there's darkness, you get it? And there's female and male. Mm. And like, you know, there's ocean and land and like, you know, etc. You know what I mean? Like everything can be segregated in this like two category mm. in a very, um, very like uh, generalized way, you mm. get it? I'm not saying there's no <laughs> the shades of grey between mm. and um, I'm pretty sure there exists as well. If you took one extreme to the other, there's always going to be a binary. Mm. You know, two sides and one half. I know me as I'm understanding. And um, no, that's not true. Yeah, actually. 
<laughs> so what I was trying to say is basically, guys, we are not just this body or mm. something. If there is a physical side to things, there must be a spiritual side mm. as well. But science is, or science has a difficult of comprehending this side either. Mm. Because you cannot measure it, you cannot see it. Mm. It's irrational. How can you actually, you know, <clears throat> speak on this, do you get it? If you can't quantify or determine it. But at the same time, how do you know someone's angry? How do you know someone is kind? Mm. How do you know someone's happy? Mm. You cannot put that under the microscope oh. and to measure it. Mm. You know, but we know when someone's angry, right? True, yeah. Do you we, even if they do not express it, you know, in a physical term, you know when you enter a room and someone's angry, you can feel that. Uh, how what can that how can you explain that in science scientific uh, term do you think? People say, Oh, you know, you can determine it by the way they act and you know and the way they speak and everything. But at the same time you can like sometimes that doesn't work because you can be polite to each other but you can hold great anger towards that person mm. you can on the surface you, you you may look polite but inside you feel really angry right? <laughs> yeah mm. you can have that a bit but some people who are more receptive to that mm. can sense that as well but how do you explain that in scientific mm. terms right you cannot form like i say you cannot quantify that mm. and we all know that you get it it's like i remember one one time like um this guy this religious person who which religion i'm not gonna name names no. of a religion okay just like in general terms like you know with this person were like um were studying in university and one of the university lecture i don't know what the curriculum or like the lecture was about it was like you know you know scientific evidence of spiritual god and whatnot to get it and like you know this person was deeply religious person and mm. like you know that professor knew that that person was religious mm. so he brought him into the <coughs> in front of the class mm. And asked him in front of class, you know, you know, he said to him, like, you know, can you smell your God? Can you hear your God? Can you touch and feel your God? Mm. You know, you cannot, then that's not scientific, scientifically, you know, valid in what mm. you believe in everything. Then that ter person turned around and said to everyone, so everyone, can you see, can you see this professor's intellect? Can you smell it? Can you hear it? Mm. Can you feel this intellect? Mm. If you can't feel it, that means he has no intellect. Mm. <laughs> that's, why, that's why he said it, because mm. you know, you cannot quantify intellectual capacity, mm. right? Just like that, you know, and like thoughts and everything. And so that's a good way to like, you know, mm. counteract <laughs> that nonsense, basically. So it's like kind of like, People seem to like deny this aspect of like um, mm. human experience because you know we cannot quantify it, we cannot know and whatnot. Yeah. But at the same time, we all know that these things exist, and like you know, we live in a world of duality. Mm. Duality. So like, I really have hard time to understanding why people struggle with this. Mm. Like you know. <laughs> Do you get it? Oh, God. Well, today's world is like a material world, world. so like yeah. the uh, normal human beings are forced to believe like like buying stuff or like and make themselves looking mm. good or this kind of thing they force it to do this kind of thing so they forget mm. about like they think about outside they're not thinking inside a heart 
So that's why today, like, there's uh, so many people that suicide in or like uh, they get like a mental problem or something like yeah. this because they got forced to, like, uh, do being like, like this picture who media is like uh, showing. They they thinking that's like a best life. That's like you say it's kind of like a today's like icon or kind of thing like idols and celebrities like it's they showing us like this is like only perfect one or like this is like a happiness or it's showing the media is showing like this so that's why people's like losing a faith so mm. that's like a feel today mm. well you know people want things to be immediate right basically like you know it's all flashy and like you know you have these products and you know media and celebrities and Netflix and whatnot. You get it. That <laughs> it's like an instant gratification and like presentation. I'm not saying those things are bad if you can, you know, use it um, wisely, basically, mm. and according to things. Because we live in a physical world. Of course, we need physical things to survive. Yeah, mm. but that shouldn't take away. This idea or notion that we have something beyond this physical、mm. idea, you get it.、Mm. So, why this is like considered to be the most important thing? It's like a shift in our current age in which our capacity is stunted because of this whole materialistic kind of like、um, mm. idea. Basically, you know, yeah. And、um, if you look back to our ancient history, I mean, almost all major civilization、mm-hmm. had some form of spirituality、mm-hmm. at the center of the kind of like、um, <clears throat> in the civilization, right? Basically, if you look at ancient Greece and like. Egypt, and Middle East, they all had a great reverence for something unseen. You get it? And I don't even need to go too into detail about this whole notion. You get it? Just kidding. So it's kind of like、um, realize it, please. Like you know. Like I don't, you. Because I think we live in a world where we are lacking this awareness. You know, you know that side. I mean, as the new age is talking about this whole the consciousness of life and love and whatnot, and like you know. And there's nothing bad in this world, and everything is perfect as long as you can have certain, you know, classes and quarters to、mm. practice yoga or meditation, and love and light and you know, determination and whatnot. And I mean that's good and all, but that's not really practical in a sense that I mean. That is understanding on a surface level. What what do we really strive to understand? You know,、mm-hmm. through that, <clears throat> are we just gonna feel good about it and like you know, not do anything about it? You know, you can have all the information about the spiritual knowledge and like you know, wisdom of our past, but if we don't put it into practice. It's like saying, okay, I know all about Italian cooking, right? I read all about it, and like you know, I know how to make pizza in a traditional way and pasta and everything. But you've never made pasta or pizza in your、mm. life. What the fuck is that?、Mm. Do to you? Do you? It's like there's no point. <laughs> That's what I mean. Like you know, having that knowledge about things is. Of course, it's important and it's okay and everything, but if we don't take a step to actually put that into our lives, then we bear fruit. 
we bear no fruit mm. from our understanding. So yeah, so I feel that there's like a more practical way to apply this. Virtue. What is your output like? Uh, if you okay, so like when you like learn something like uh, what you want to use it for. Like, for example, like uh, let's say like you you told me before like uh, you want to share this like knowledge to people. Like mm -hmm. I think there's like a one of like an output as well. Is is I think it's a really good thing. Like if you can help somebody to wake up or something. Oh yeah. It, it, you know, yeah. So I met, I remember I wasn't like this kind of person before, like but when I when I met this kind of spiritual people they just like I feel like what they're talking about. But actually like later on is a make a sense and just like if I look back at myself, it's just like it just blind eyes like kinda of like it's it's uh, it's dangerous. It's like kinda of like you don't know anything then like now I know the things like spiritual things try to make somebody wake up is I think it's like one of the duties that the people do mm. like well the thing is right if you're gonna convince others of my spiritual ideas and everything mm. then we need to really be practical about it do yeah. it and you know not a lot of people mistaken that like spiritual ideas are just it's like a philosophy or just an idea that you can mm. kind of emble embellish it in your life and everything. But it's just like you, there's actually a lot of techniques that you can actually implement mm. in your daily techniques. Um, meditation, you know, like, yoga, this kind yeah, of yeah. Thing? I mean, meditation is definitely one of them, mm. and like you know, yoga is. Um, definitely um, very fine scientific kind of like um, kind of technique in which to elevate your kind of like um, conscious thought and everything and there are many different disciplines you can practice to do like you know shamanism and like you know connecting with nature in a profound way and everything you know like um We're starting to understand, like, you know, we had this like a crazy, crazy, like a new age phase in the early 2000s or 90s. And we're, we're starting to mishmash all this, like, uh, idea of like different philosophy and religious idea from mm -hmm. around the world. And people were just taking what they like, cherry picked, and like, you know, mm -hmm. implementing it in life. That might have, like, helped and worked out certain things. But we need to get back to our roots, basically, because mm. what did our ancestors practice, basically, mm. you know? Yeah, exactly. What did the Europeans practice? What did the Middle Eastern practice? Mm. Like, you know, what not? And you know, I'm not, I'm not like bashing like you know the mainstream religion in our mm. world, like you know, as we all know. I don't even need to name it, but I'm just saying like. Every place on earth had some sort of like mm. some form of like religious practice, mm. yeah. And what who can who can say that that is not valid mm. than the other religions or like spiritual practice, yeah. Those people who practiced it on those lands can testify that they, those worked, yeah. Mm. I mean. If you're talking about even a few hundred years ago, people were, you know, struggling daily to survive. Mm. They weren't philosophizing and like, you know, mm. <laughs> talking about things, what the nature of cosmos was in mm. those days. They were actually like, you know, mm. working out how to like, you know, eat, eat mm. the next day and everything. Mm. Yeah. So those people were very practical in a way they thought things, did they? Mm. They weren't aware about, I mean, even in the, you know, this kind of 
in a Western country as well, not the United States, but probably the elites or the highly educated people might have indulged in the philosophy of mm. you know, cosmology or idea of things and everything. But ordinary people had no <laughs> education, you get it? Oh, they man. needed to farm. To survive. Yeah, they need to survive by mm. farming mm. and like, you know, Could be fishing, fishing hunting. hunting, to you know, to even just survive a day, you get it? What makes you think these people were discussing that kind of philosophy? Mm. I think most of them didn't. Mm. But what you can say is like, you know, some of them did incorporate certain spiritual practices. Mm. And what we can say is like, those were like animistic belief. Mm. So, if you're talking about in a Western European context, people incorporated certain superstitious kind of like um, tradition or ideology into their practices you get it? like you know they believe that certain trees or forests were inhabited by certain spirits yes. and the most famous things if you took, took an example in British Isles like the concept of you know, elves or fairies. Mm. You know, those are considered to be like spirits of nature. Mm. You get it. And some people have developed a certain ritual or techniques in which to appease those spirits you know, mm. from nature. And um, yeah, so that that's where. All this like uh, folk magic or folklore has emerged mm -hmm. in where people have like kind of like um, understood that in order to survive in nature you need to appease nature mm -hmm. and but what our ancestors knew was that nature was not a static you know static thing in which they didn't have a life mm. they believed that it was possessed by certain spirits mm. so they did all sorts of like um rituals and celebration to appease those spirits you know? and this can be observed in many different cultures not just european you know East Asia, Mesoamerica, I mean, there's like a countless accounts of people appeasing certain spirits of the areas and locals mm. to actually gain favor of their powers and everything. Mm. You know, you know. This is where all these like folk festivals mm. appear, basically. If we're talking about Japan, how many festivals are there in Japan? Mm. Yeah. Everywhere you go, there's like at least in one village you have a festival. Mm. Right? You can say those are like um, ritualistic gatherings of the villagers to appease the local spirits mm. because they believe that certain spirits govern certain areas of district. So, what they do is like <clears throat> they sacrifice certain harvest mm -hmm. of the grains or like you know rice of that mm -hmm. year to those local spirits so they build a shrine mm -hmm. and in the shrine they will sacrifice certain a harvest of the rice mm -hmm. or the rice wine of sake to them to appease the local spirits mm -hmm. of that area so those local spirits can bless those villages mm. around the district in order for them to be protected throughout the year and mm. give good luck to them and everything. There's, this has been like recorded many times in like in a folkloric tradition and in those areas and then it's like um, is con continued even to those days. People nowadays when they do these kind of like uh, festivals they may not know the significance of 
deeper aspect of that mm, understanding but that's what they're doing basically mm. they're appeasing the spirit of that mm. land basically that li- that they live in they live on mm. you know so that's quite interesting to see you know but in our modern times we are so disconnected with our nature around us especially if you're in the city wherever you are you get it we don't have this concept of like local yeah. deities or nature I mean, spirits we don't know. like to say to like a street light like <laughs> thank you very much i don't know um, yeah so but those things this impulse of wanting to connect with something deeper than the surface level mm. has always existed in all levels of society mm. whether you're aristocrat middle class or you know peasants or whatnot you get it they all form certain rituals or certain practices in order to communicate with these beings which may reside in other side you get it mm. and um if you're taking the example of like you know you know, the British Isles and everything. Britain, in general, has been a very magical place to get, like, extremely. Even today? What? Yeah. From, really? the, like... from the past to present, to oh. this day, it has formed many magical traditions. Like? Like... If you're talking about the past, you have the folkloric understanding that mm-hmm. certain ideas of like, you know, um, nature spirit has existed. If you're talking about, you know, the most common thing is like the fairies, the elves, and like, you mm-hmm. know, Bogard, and all these like different supernatural creatures, like the black dog, and all this like, um, different spirit that they believe that they, uh, he has in, inhabited those lands mm. and they have form, formed certain spiritual kind of understanding behind it mm. even though people say okay Britain is a Christian land and everything it's actually quite pagan and animistic mm. in a sense you get it why do you mean Britain I don't know England itself, it means like Britain Island, right? including a, a, a island as well, like you know. the Northern Islands, like uh-huh. um, you know, United Kingdom as well. So you know, I mean, like people, they, they, it's like uh, always this kind of like a uh, fantasy comics always starts from like a Britain, right? Mm. Like some of the kanji ga Yeah, mm. it's almost like it depends on the country and where they was formed and everything mm. actually because. You know, like um, I think I think most culture have developed certain kind of magical tradition or oh, animistic. Well, I saw that yeah. in, even in Japan there is kind of like a magical, like a jujutsu or this kind of thing. Yeah, jujutsu and like you know, and all that. Maybe Abe no Seimei or something. Yeah, exactly. And also, kind of like. Um, I mean, it's been present and everything, mm-hmm. but on the, I think each culture has a different approach to these kind of like uh, animistic culture, yeah. uh, animistic concept as well. Mm-hmm. So they may develop certain system to actually communicate mm-hmm. with those kind of entities and supernatural mm-hmm. forces. But in my opinion, I think Britain has developed one of the most like a um, comprehend, like deep and comprehensive, like um, mm. magical tradition regarding those kind of like spirits. Do you know? Um. Yeah, and if you know about the witchcraft mm. persecution within Europe and everything, 16th or 17th century, it, it has been like a huge thing. Do you know? like, mm thousands of so-called witches or warlock has been like you know burn up the state so what, what, what were these people doing 
So basically what these people were doing right there, I think for most part they were like uh, healers. Mm -hmm. So they used herbal healing concoctions, they made certain potions mm -hmm. to heal someone from their ailments mm -hmm. and everything, did it. But at the same time, they had a systematic like um, ritual and belief in which they communicate with the other worlds as well. Like, mm -hmm. um, like um, they had a certain belief that like you know you could communicate with nature spirits, which they called the fairies or mm -hmm. you know the the tree spirits and whatnot. So mm -hmm. what they do is like basically they leave offerings in the forest mm. for these mm. you know nature spirits you know and like you know for them to like you know um <clears throat> have certain favors upon them or when they're doing like you know if they are like let's say if they're gathering certain herbs or like some kind of fruits mm. from the forest they will give a certain offering to the forest spirit mm -hmm. because they believe that forest had certain guardian spirits mm -hmm. in which they can be, which they can appease together. So mm -hmm. they say, okay, the forest of the spirits, I'll give you this offering of. What well, was it like? A, what could be? Was it like a dead goat or what, what, what was it like? This kind of like thing, Guinea. Taking off, oh, no. like a sacrifice, yeah. Oh. Um, but if you're talking about like the the ordinary folk or like peasant people, what they did was like they they've given certain crops of their harvest, oh. basically. So if they harvested certain grains or like um, certain vegetables or like milk and whatnot, they will put the offering. In the forest and say okay i'll give you this and i'll harvest i am entering in this forest to harvest certain fruits or like herbs i'll give the guardian of this forest spirit i'll give you this offering in exchange of that basically mm -hmm. so they gave you they gave that kind of like an offering just a piece that kind of like um, nature spirit so they can safely harvest those kind of mm. like um, fruits in the forest basically you know so they have this kind of like um, concept as well even like in Native American culture as well I remember I've heard someone like in when they're hunting right so let's say some Native American tribe or person like hunted like um like a deer or something mm. so they will basically hunt the deer and when they basically kill the deer mm. they will go up to the deer and they pray to deer and what they pray to deer was like okay i might i may have killed you this time and this time through your sacrifice i will it British can feed on your flesh oh. and not flesh and your body and everything. Oh. Another thing, I pray to you that since I since I have um, hunted you and elim uh, killed you, I just eliminate you on this time. In my next life, you can hunt me <laughs> so for the yeah. and hunt me and oh. to eliminate and like and feed your own tribe. Yeah. That's the prayer they used to say. Say to it's like people. yeah well that sounds like they know like a reincarnation or something it means mm. like yeah this concept of reincarnation has oh, existed sorry, that's interesting in Meso mesoamerican like culture oh. as well so they've incorporated that in the ritual practice of like mm. even the hunting right mm. so i mean mm. a little bit sounds like a Japanese itadakimasu, like I don't know, just I feel like some kind of similar connection. Mm. Like, it's like Ariato was able to just like, say thank yeah. you and just so it's like kind of like praising certain higher forces mm. for um, 
the abundance of crops or food that you get from nature, mm -hmm. right? You, your peace is higher, your peace is appreciated and like, you know, thanks those higher forces mm -hmm. that you, they provided them for that, you know. Even in this Christian kind of like um, concept, you have a prayer of like before the meal, and like, you know, mm -hmm. you praise the Lord that you, they have provided you with this like mm -hmm. food and like, you know, we'll thank you and like, you know, bless this food so we can have certain, you know, blessing upon that food mm. for us to nourish. This concept has existed in all sorts of, like, spiritual tradition. It's not unique to mm. one tradition, you know. Mm. So, this kind of, like, um, idea is prevalent in, like, you know, different places. Mm. So, say, So my whole point is like, you know, a uh, pe lot of people don't acknowledge, try to acknowledge this, mm. but like, you know, nature is alive to the end. <laughs> yeah, because it seems like plants and, you know, trees don't seem to move around much. You, people seem to think seem to think, oh, they have no conscious, you know, um, thoughts or mm. like, you know, will mm. behind them, but that's not true, you know, from what, what we can observe from the ancient culture, mm. you know, even in our kind of like experience, experiments in our recent years, have come to conclusion that actually trees communicate with each other. Oh, I heard so as well. Yeah, you've heard of it, yeah. right? And it's quite to improve and like, you know, they seem to communicate that, like, you know, if certain trees are being cut down, they send a signal through scent mm. or like certain. It was, it's kind of telepathy, kind of. Yeah, exactly, certain yeah. vibration that they, you know. If you cut down, you need to be, be careful and like, you know, they can't kind of like send any kind of signal mm. towards them. And it's been observed and all that kind of thing. And then, you know, people say it was pseudoscience or whatever. But it's just like, you know, we know that plants and trees are living things as well. Mm. They may not move around like, you know, these mammals, as mm. you can see, like foxes or like, you know, raccoons or rabbits or whatnot, you get it. But it doesn't mean they don't, they're not alive. Mm. <laughs> it, it's so obvious. Uh. And, but people don't seem to like put a lot of emphasis on those kind of like, um... Don't <sighs> move. Yeah, exactly. Plant, plants or mm. like, you know, trees. But if you look back to our ancient ancestors, they were very aware that these plants or trees have certain forces of mm. life behind them. Mm. That's why they were very careful not to disturb certain mm. kind of tree spirits or mm. you know, plant spirits mm. around the local area. Mm. They formed a very complicated rituals actually not to offend those kind of mm. spirits, you know, which is quite interesting when you think, mm. okay, if these people were <laughs> thinking each day how to survive everything. Uh, Why would they even come up with such a complicated form of, you know, rituals mm -hmm. in order to accommodate that? Because they mm -hmm. wouldn't think about it. They were just like, okay, I need to get my berries. I need to get my you know, harvest of like potatoes and everything. Mm -hmm. I don't give a shit what, what goes around it. <laughs> I, mean, I just want that. You know, mm -hmm. you know, but the fact that they develop this kind of form of a ritual or like, you know, mm. interaction with these like certain natures and, and natural environment speaks uh, speaks volumes basically. Mm. Like, why did they do that? Mm. If they had no time for that kind of thing. Do you get it? They were fighting each day to survive. Yeah, mm. people, they get, you know, of course, 
if you live in a town, a small village, you might have, you might go to a marketplace in which you can, you know, buy certain products like mm. vegetables or meat or whatnot to get it from that area. Mm. But sometimes you need to self-sustain as well. Mm. You, know, you need to grow your own farm, mm. crops to, you know, to survive and everything. But why would they develop those kind of rituals mm. if they even they didn't have time for that kind of mm. thing? You know, it's just like, yeah. This that means they knew it, right? They yeah. They knew something that we didn't, you know, because I feel like in our modern world, because we live in us. Most of us live in the city, or towns, mm. and whatnot. We've been provided with all these like necessities in mind, so we don't have this like uh, interaction with nature too mm. much. Really. So I feel like we've uh, lost connection with nature in a certain extent. We we <laughs> we interact with nature more. Less compared to our mm. ancestors, that's for sure. You get it? Mm. So, this kind of understanding of the natural forces of life is kind of thin mm. within our culture. So, yeah, I mean, take as you wish is like, you know, that's how our ancestors kind of um, interacted mm. with the nature. And whether people believe it or not, that's what happened. 